In the previous video, I introduced the RDTSC instruction. This instruction has been with us since the Pentium, and as its name implies, read timestamp counter, it's something that gets us the value of this thing called a timestamp counter, which is something that measures how many cycles have elapsed. Now, unfortunately for us, when they moved to the invariant TSC era, it meant that this no longer meant literal core cycles for a particular core we were running on. And the reason for that is because they decided that RDTSC should return a consistent value across cores for whatever reason, that's what they decided. So when cores boost up to higher frequencies or when they throttle down to lower frequencies to conserve power, we no longer have a TSC value that measures how many cycles a particular core has executed. This creates problems for benchmarking and performance analysis, which is what we're mostly concerned about in this class. And of course, what we'll be learning as we go forward is that there's other ways we can interrogate the chip to find out more accurate measures of things like cycles. But before we do that, I would like to underscore some important parts about RDTSC, and that's what I'd like to do today. First off, RDTSC is still very useful, and that's why I taught it in the previous video. It's still very useful because it's available basically everywhere. You can always count on RDTSC being something that a processor supports if it's an x86 processor at all. That's because it's been there since the Pentium, and it's been working the entire time. So while there are all these subtleties about it you have to learn, and the behavior of the timestamp counter may change depending on the platform, you still know you can call it. So it's one of the few high-frequency timing things you can actually do that you know will always be there. Everything else we're going to learn requires drivers or special tooling or maybe only is there on certain processors. There's always a little catch. There's a caveat for every other thing we're going to learn that might be better than RDTSC for a particular purpose. But the other big reason to learn it is because RDTSC now actually forms the high-precision timer for most operating system things. This is something that's very poorly understood because a lot of information on the internet was written before that was true. There was a thing called an HPET, which was a thing that was used for operating system time beforehand. And when you called things like query performance counter, which again we saw in the previous video, you were actually asking about some other timer that had nothing to do with RDTSC, for example. But now, in the invariant TSC era, it's important to understand that a lot of people who think they're calling something that isn't RDTSC are actually calling RDTSC. So what I'd like to do in this video is show you what that means and to use the assembly language knowledge that you learned in part one of this course to show how you don't have to take anyone's word for it to find out what is actually the time basis in a particular operating system call on your platform. Let's take a look at what happens if we just inspect a call to query performance counter. Because I don't have the source code to Microsoft Windows, what I have to do is use a debugger which can show me the disassembly of the Windows functions that I call. Now, not all Windows functions in their entirety will be able to be disassembled because some of them will involve syscalls. And if we wanted to debug actual syscalls, which are things that transition down to ring zero in the operating system, we would need a more complicated setup for debugging. But because Query Performance Counter does not do a syscall, we can use just regular user level debug to inspect the disassembly of that call. What I'm going to use is listing 71, the same thing we used last week for looking at query performance counter. And I'm just going to go ahead and step into the read OS timer call that we wrote, which just calls query performance counter. Now, instead of stepping over this call like we normally would, what I'm going to do is switch to the disassembly view here in my debugger, and I'm just going to go ahead and step to the call instruction, which of course we already know what that does. We learned that in part one of the class. So now I'm going to step into this call, and what we can see is that I end up in the Windows function query performance performance counter here in the actual disassembly. Now, we don't know where we are other than that. You can see in the call stack, we're just in NTDLL. That's because I don't have any symbols installed for this part of the operating system. So the debugger doesn't actually know where we are, but that's okay because we don't really care. We just want to look at what the call is doing in assembly language. Now, if we look, we can see that the beginning of the function does basic things we would expect, like setting up the stack there, just like we looked at at part one. And then it does some testing, none of which actually causes any branches. Now, you know what all this stuff is, right? 
test JZ, test JZ, right? It's doing jump if zeros, loading some things and doing some jump if zeros, all stuff we already know. Now, because none of these jumps seem to get taken, we don't really have to care that much about what they are for our purposes. If we were doing really hardcore reverse engineering, we might want to spend some time looking at what those jumps actually do. You know, maybe we're investigating the security of this function or other things like that. We'd have to look at them. But we just want to know where the time is coming from. And what we can see here is right away, we get to a very simple sequence that pretty much tells us where the time is coming from. RDTSCP, followed by SHL, followed by OR. That actually gives us a very good picture already of where query performance counter is getting its time from. So there you can see, without having to ask any questions or post on Stack Overflow or do any other kind of guesswork, you can see for yourself, just by stepping into the call, exactly what query performance counter is really measuring. It's just measuring the timestamp counter. It's issuing an RDTSC P instruction, which is exactly the same as an RDTSC instruction with two slight caveats. And let's explain what those are now. First of all, exactly like RDTSC, it's going to put into EAX the low part of the TSC, and then into EDX, it's going to put the high part of the timestamp counter. This is exactly the same as the RDTSC instruction that we looked at last time. However, the P part actually refers to another thing it's going to do. Into the ECX register, it's going to put something called the PID or processor ID, processor core ID might be a better way to think about it. And what it does is it says which of the cores in the CPU was actually running this particular RDTSCP, meaning what core was the thread assigned to when it actually executed this instruction. Now, this actually has its own instruction. There is an instruction called RDPID you can use just to get that particular piece of information. But because it's the kind of thing that you might want to know when you're writing something like a profiler, right? You want to know which core is running what. Well, why not get the timestamp counter and the processor ID in one convenient instruction? And that is RDTSCP which again, has not existed for as long as RDTSC, so it's not always available, but it is available in most processors, certainly any processors released in the recent past. Now there's one other thing that RDTSCP does that we won't really talk about much here, but that's that it has some different characteristics with respect to the out of order execution of the processor. That's something we'll cover a little later in the course, so I'll just briefly mention that it exists here as a thing, but once we get to the out of order window, it will make more sense, so we'll explain it more there. For now, we only really care about this part because it's the only part that the query performance counter timing code actually needs in order for us to understand it. So what happened right after the RDTSC P? Well, it did the following instruction sequence, if you recall. It does an SHL of RDX with OX20, 20, 20 hex. Well, what's 20 hex? It's 32, right? So one, two, four, eight in one hex digit, right? 16, 32, two in the second hex digit. So this is a shift left by 32 of the 64-bit register that it put the high value in, right? Now this makes perfect sense because the high value was put in the low 32 bits. So we're shifting it up to put it in the high slot. What does it do after that? Or RDX and RAX fuse together the two parts. RAX is the 64-bit register that the low part was put into. This is the low 32 bits in EAX. RAX is the 64-bit width one. It does a 64-bit fusion of those by doing an OR. This combines them together, right? So what are we doing there? In this particular one, we have a register. We've got 32 bits in the bottom. That's the high 32 bits of the value we want. We're shifting it up to put it here. Then we've got another one, which is going to have the low 32 bits in here already. We're oring these two together to get something that has the high and the low in one register. We're just putting the original 64-bit TSC value back together again because it came into halves. So we can see exactly where query performance counter is getting its time source from. It's just the timestamp counter. So when people are wondering, should I call query performance counter or should I call RDTSC? Well, the answer depends on what you're expecting to happen. 
if you are trying to have the operating system just pick a good timing source for you because you don't really know, maybe you've made an executable that's supposed to run on random end user machines and you just don't know, you just want it to give you back some reliable time source, well, Query Performance Counter makes perfect sense. It will use something like an HPET on older systems and it will use RDTSCP on newer systems. That's what you wanted. If, on the other hand, what you're trying to do is profile things, there's no point in calling Query Performance Counter, right? Because all it is is a call to RDTSC, which you could have done yourself, that, as we'll see in a second, throws away precision to drop the resolution of the timer down to 10 megahertz. Now let's look at how that part happens. We already know it does this because if you remember last week, we did Query Performance Frequency and it consistently returned on multiple machines 10 megahertz. Now we know that RDTSC's frequency is going to be up in things like 3, 4, 5 billion, right? 3, 4, 5 gigahertz because it runs at CPU frequencies. So how does it go from calling RDTSCP, which we know will be at a frequency in gigahertz, how does it drop that down to 10 megahertz, which it must if that's what it's actually going to start returning? Let's take a look at the rest of the assembly. After reading the timestamp counter and reassembling the 64-bit value, what you can see is Query Performance Counter now loads RAX and RCX with two constants that we don't really know where they're coming from. They're just some values that it's going to use. And then it issues a mul RDX. Now the mul instruction, as we know, is an unsigned integer multiply, and we haven't looked at it that much in the class, but it's going to do the multiply with another implicit register that's not listed, which is RAX. So it's going to multiply multiply the 64-bit timestamp counter we reconstructed here in RDX by some magical constant that was loaded into RAX. It's then going to load something into EAX, which it doesn't really look like this matters much to us, because we then do an add of RDX to RCX, which is the other constant we loaded. Then we do some stuff with EX that doesn't really affect us, because we don't do this jump. We move another constant into CL, and then we add R11, another constant we loaded, into RDX, and then we shift right RDX by CL. So in terms of what we actually did to RDX, we multiplied it by a constant, we added a constant to it, we added another constant to it, and then we shifted it by a constant. So it's basically mul add shift. That's what we're doing here. Now, if we look at the end of the function, that's it. We never touch RDX again. And in fact, we write RDX out right here into that parameter that was passed in. So really, RDX holds the value we're going to hand back the entire time. We construct the timestamp counter in it, we do a mull against it, we add to it twice, and then we shift it, and that's the thing we actually write back. So what does that do? So this sequence of operations is much less easy to understand. We learned all of the instructions in part one of the course. Nothing is a surprise here. Like I said, almost all x64 code you will read is something you could have understood even if you only knew x86 assembly language. They're that similar. So none of the instructions are weird, but it's kind of an unusual sequence. Now, if we think about what we would expect to see, right? Like, what would we be doing if we ourselves were supposed to write some code that was going to transform something from a 4.2 gigahertz timer to a 10 megahertz timer? What would we want to write? Well, we would assume that we would take our clock value, right? And we would multiply it by the ratio between the clock value we want and the clock value we're getting. So we're basically saying, all right, we want a 10 megahertz clock and let's go ahead and divide that by what we're actually getting, which is a 2.4 gigahertz clock, yeah? Which is just equivalent to, you know, 10 over 4,200, right? That's, that's really all we're doing here. One over 420 might be the way to say it. Elon Musk would be proud. So effectively what we see here is this equation is what we actually would expect. But what we're seeing instead is it loading effectively three constants, actually four constants, but two of them are used for an add, so they could have actually been fused together. One shift constant and one multiply constant. Effectively what we see is mul add shift. And the shift is right, so it's a divide, effectively, right? It's, it's reducing the number. So we're loading a constant to multiply by, and this multiply is a, is a mul RDX, right? 
We're adding to that same value, that RDX, and we're shifting that RDX. Now, we actually do two separate ads, but that's neither here nor there because two separate ads could have been fused into one. It doesn't really do anything with the value in the in in interim. So this is effectively the sequence we're executing. Now, we haven't really studied the mull instruction very much, right? I talked about the fact that we would be seeing it, um, and we sort of understand it, but we haven't really studied it in detail. So it's worth talking about one more time exactly what this is going to do. A mull RDX, now RDX, that's the 64-bit register. And mull on Intel hardware is actually defined to do the full width multiply. What this means is that this will multiply by the implicit other register, which is RAX. This will do RDX times RAX, and it will produce the full 128-bit result. The high result will go into RDX, and the low result will go back into RAX. It, it overwrites both of those things with the full result. So we're doing 64 times 64 and producing the full 128. So what we're seeing here is we're multiplying 64 by 64, keeping the high, adding something to the high, and then shifting the high, right? We shift it by CL, which we loaded. What is this doing? How could that possibly be computing this? We know it's computing this because we know it's giving us back a 10 megahertz timer. And we know the source is some gigahertz timer, 4.2, something like that. How is that doing this? Well, this gives me a chance to plug the book I plug all the time. It's one of John Blow's favorite books, too. I learned about this book from him, and it is fantastic. I use it all the time. It's like the only programming book that's actually next to my desk that I read all the time, and that is Hacker's Delight. Because this course is about performance-aware programming, I don't cover in detail all the little tricks you might use to shave an instruction off of an assembly language sequence. That's a cool thing, and you know we probably will have some stuff where I talk about things like that, but overall, our goal here is to learn about performance and how it works, not to become expert instruction level optimizers. But for those of you who want those skills, Hacker's Delight has just a wealth of information. And this little trick right here is an entire section of Hacker's Delight. What is that trick? The trick is doing integer divides by doing integer multiplies followed by a shift. How does this work? Well, read Hacker's Delight for the full version, because since it is discrete math, meaning these are not continuous numbers, they are literally integer numbers, there's a lot of subtlety to it, and you need the full mull add shift in order to actually get precise results if that's what you wanted. But I can show you the basis of the technique in continuous numbers, and it's very easy to understand. So let me explain basically how that works. If I wanted to do a multiply that produced something like this, right? We know that in continuous math, where we can just do floating point uh, values or, you know, if we have infinite precision, any of that stuff, then we can just compute this ratio. 10, you know, we can, we can do 1 over 420, compute that as a floating point number, and just do the multiply. So it's, it's easy to see how we would turn a divide into a multiply. It's so simple. We don't have to divide by 420. We multiply by 1 over 420. Problem solved. Well, if you think about how this integer multiply works, we're getting back the high 64 bits. What are the high 64 bits of a 128-bit number? It's the 128-bit number divided by 2 to the 64th, right? We removed the whole bottom 64 bits of the number. So this instruction implicitly multiplies by RAX and then divides by 2 to the 64, right? So we're already doing a divide. We're doing a divide by 2 to the 64. So all we really need to do is say, well, we want this ratio to be the same as the ratio we actually wanted, right? We want this value, we want to solve for what that would be in order to produce the ratio we actually wanted. So what would that value be? Well, just do, you know, your basic math homework here, right, and cross multiply. 
right? So if we load RAX with a value derived from this particular equation, then when we do the mul high, we will actually get the answer that is dividing by this 420. We can divide with a multiply because there's already a divisor built in. And we just have to produce the numerator that accounts for when divided, it becomes that ratio. Now, again, it really is that simple conceptually, but in order to get precise results in discrete math, if you actually wanted them to be precise, which in this case, I don't really think you would have needed it to be, but that's a separate story. In order to get precise results, you have to do a little bit more work. You need to be able to vary this denominator. So instead of 2 to the 64, you want to have everything between 2 to the 64 and 2 to the 127, basically. You want to be able to use an additional shift. So after divide by 2 to 64, you divide by more. That's what this shift right does. So this CL here is if you needed to shift it more in order to get an accurate result. The add, again, is because for unsigned multiplies, you have to have an adjustment in there sometimes. Again, not going to go into this stuff because it's just a simple trick to turn divs into moles when you need this, and that is often something people were trying to do, especially when divides were even more expensive relative to multiplies than they are now. But, you know, in general, they're always, moles are always cheaper, so this you see this pattern fairly frequently. So if you want those details, go read Hacker's Delight. It's got entire sections on this for signed and unsigned uh, division by constants. It's got all that. It also talks about a whole bunch of related things with how to do divides faster. Divides when you know the remainder is zero, for example, which is very common when you're compiling the C language, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So that's actually what's going on here. And just to prove it to you, we can actually go in when we're stepping through the assembly, we can see what value they loaded into RAX. And if we want to, we could verify that it actually is that ratio. We can verify that RAX over the total shift, we're going to have to look at this CL, remember, as well. But we can look at what the CL value is, and if it's non-zero, we have to account for it. Look at what the RAX value is and reproduce the correct ratio and see, does it equal one, well, does it equal 10 megahertz over our actual TSC frequency we expect, which would be like the base frequency of the processor roughly or something like that. So let's take a look. Is that what actually happens? Are we right that this is the technique they're using? And that's why those instructions show up in Query Performance Counter. So first things first, if I go ahead and run system info and I look to see what the actual speed of the processor I'm running on is to give us a sense of what we'd expect the timestamp counter to be, we get that 4.2 gigahertz number, which is what I would expect. And furthermore, if I run listing 73 from last time, we can verify what the timestamp counter frequency appears to be. Again, 4.2 gigahertz. So we're pretty sure that the timestamp counter on this machine should be running at 4.2 gigahertz. Which means if we do that ratio of 10 megahertz versus 4.2 gigahertz, we see a value of 0.00238, blah, 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 blah. And so what we want to see now is, does the value that we load into RAX for that query performance counter assembly divided by 2 to the 64 plus whatever the CL shift is, does that give us the same ratio? If it does, we're at least pretty sure that what Curry Performance Counter is doing is exactly what we think it's doing. If it's something else, then maybe we got it wrong. I mean, we are doing reverse engineering here, so we're really just guessing as to what the code does based on our own kind of pattern matching ability, right? If I go ahead and repeat the process of running this program and stepping back into the assembly language for Query Performance Counter, now as we go, we can watch all of these things happen and see what the values actually are. First of all, just for curiosity's sake, if you'd like to see the reassembly of the 64-bit number, we can look at the hexadecimal versions of RDX and RAX, which is where the timestamp counter values got placed, and you can watch it get reconstructed. Here is the high 32 bits of the value, and watch it's going to show shift it up to put them in the high 32 bits of the register. There you go. Now it's going to take the low 32 bits of the timestamp counter and OR those in. 
See? So just like we thought, it's reconstructing the timestamp counter as a 64-bit value. Now it's going to load the multiply constant and the add constant, and we can look at what both of those are. Here is the multiply constant, and here is the add constant. We can see it's not actually using an add constant here, but that's the multiply constant. Now we're gonna have to copy this value because it's gonna overwrite it right after it does the multiply. So we have to copy this value out and put it into our calculator so we can use it in a second. Now let's double check what the other constants are. At the end, we are going to do an add with R11, what's that value? And we're going to do a shift with CL, what's that value? So as we can see, we don't have any additional shift. So it's just two to the 64 is our denominator. And then R11, to be honest, don't have any idea what this value is. It looks like some kind of offset value. Fortunately for us, the adds don't really matter to us because if we want to see if we're right about the timestamp counter, if we take two query performance counter measurements, we're just gonna subtract them, right? We do like two over one second and we'd subtract the two to see what the frequency was. Well, when we subtract the two, any constant that we are adding will just disappear, right? It doesn't actually do anything because we're just subtracting it from itself. So we really only care about the RAX value and the CL value in terms of our understanding of the function. The add offset, well, we could try to reverse engineer what that value actually is for, like why is it trying to offset these numbers? But for our purposes, just to see what the time base actually is, it doesn't matter to us because it's just a fixed offset. So back in our calculator, we know that what we're comparing here is that ratio that we think it should be versus the value we saw in RAX divided by two to the 64. No additional shift because CL was zero. When we ask the calculator for that ratio, lo and behold, we get almost the exact same number. You have to go out to the seventh significant digit before they actually vary. And we would expect them to vary because again, we're reproducing some exact ratio with just a fixed integer over two to the 64. So there's a limit to how exact it can actually represent the original ratio. But that's it. That pretty much proves definitively that this is what they're doing. But of course, we don't know everything everything about the function. Like we don't know how it's setting that large offset or why it's doing it because it wouldn't matter for most uses of query performance counter. And also we don't know what all those things were that it was testing, right? It's obviously got a preamble where it's doing a bunch of checks to see something, but we don't really know what those are either. So there's plenty more reverse engineering you could do. And I've never looked to see if someone on the internet perhaps has done all that reverse engineering work, but it's an interesting thing to ask. Like what's all the other stuff it's doing and why is it doing it? But for our purposes, we simply don't care. We got the answer we wanted and now we're fairly confident we know what query performance counter is doing to produce its time values. So there you have it. Now you know exactly what query performance counter does under the hood. And you can understand what all the things that people have said about it or what was true at times or not true at times, why all of that, it's important to sort of say, okay, take everything with a grain of salt. Let's understand what this actually does so we can make informed decisions about it. And what you can see here is that, well, if what you want is to just call the operating system and get a reliable timer that's relatively low precision, like 10 and megahertz in this case, then query performance counter might be a good bet. For example, you may not want to use something like RDTSC when you just ship a game or ship an application who's going to measure wall clock time, because you don't know if sometime in the future, Intel might change how RDTSC works on one of their processors, or AMD will change how RDTSC works on one of their processors. And now you're not insulated from that. You will have to ship a patch to account for that. If instead you just call query performance counter, you can count on, hopefully, fingers crossed, Microsoft to update the version of query performance counter that they use in the operating system on those chips to account for this. So what you're doing when you call query performance counter instead of RDTSC is you're asking for that layer of insulation and hoping that Microsoft provides it for you. Now you know, and you can make that decision. On the other hand, if what you're doing is collecting performance measurements, there's no reason to ever call Query Performance Counter. It's completely useless because all it's doing is doing the exact same RDTSC call you could have done directly in your code and then stripping it of all its precision by doing an unnecessary multiply and a ton of extra work. So it's basically taking more time to issue the same instruction and then getting rid of all the precision that instruction offers. So you'd be crazy to call query performance counter when you were taking performance measurements on your own machine because it's just a strictly worse version than the RDTSC instruction is when used directly. Now, if you're taking the course, my performance-aware programming course, 
then your homework is very straightforward this week. I want you to do the same thing that I just did on your machine. You need to get practice stepping through assembly language because we're going to do that more and more. You've learned it now in part one. In part two, we're going to be looking at assembly language fairly often to understand why the things that we see happening in performance are happening. So this is a great opportunity to do that. You've seen how I did it. Now you do the same thing. Does your operating system on your processor do the same thing that Query Performance Counter is doing on mine? Is it just a thinly wrapped RDTSC instruction that throws away precision, or RDTSCP instruction, I should say? Or are you running on an older chip that does something else, or maybe completely different hardware entirely? You should be able to make that determination now. If you see something very much like what I saw, you can also take the next step and say, can you verify the RAX equation to verify that you're actually going to get back your time step counter frequency. And remember, we found that time step counter frequency last week by using that um, correlation to query performance frequency. If you're not taking the course and you like this level of understanding, you like figuring out what's really going on and not just having to take some random post on the internet's word for it, then perhaps you would like to take the course. And if you would, go ahead to computerenhance.com and check it out. There's a link in the description below to the table of contents, and you can see everything we've done in the course so far. You can go through it at your own rate, and of course, you will receive in your inbox all of the new stuff when it comes out. So please check that out if you're interested. For now, that's it for RDTSC and Query Performance Counter. Next week, we'll be looking at some more of the subtleties here, and we'll be actually going into what we're going to start on for our next big thing, which is starting to do individual measurements and figuring out how to use RDTSC and its friends to look at smaller snippets of code, which of course is harder than what we did last time when we're just timing big blocks. Hope to see you back here for that. Until then, have fun programming.